Well, I welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, Sunday Night Edition. Tonight, we have a great opportunity to listen to Dr. Justin Schweitzer as he talks about all-inclusive cataract care, considerations and complications, and FACO and IOLs. Schweitzer specializes in advanced glaucoma, refractive surgical clinical care, and anterior segment pathology at the Vance Thompson Vision Institute. He regularly lectures on glaucoma, anterior segment pathology, refractive surgical care, and surgical management at the state and national level. He is chief medical editor for Modern Optometry and has continued, contributed numerous book chapters and journal articles and peer and non-peer non reviewed uh, journals, including uh, Review of Optometry, Primary Care Optometry News, and Optometric Management. He is an advocate of integrated eye care delivery models, currently serving as a board member of the South Dakota Optometric Society. He also serves as a board member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, a member of the American Optometric Association, Optometric Cornea Cataract and Refractive Society, Squirrel Lens Education Society, Intrepid Eye Society, and is very involved in community eye care initiatives. So with that, a nice virtual round of applause and welcome for Dr. Justin Schweitzer, who is going to take it over and educate us all very well. With that, Justin, please take it away. Thank you so much. Thanks for the kind introduction, Joe. I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, an honor to be here. Uh, you guys do such a wonderful job with education uh, around the country. I've had an opportunity to be involved in some other educational events with you guys. And, uh, you know, you two and, and Vanessa do such a, a wonderful job. And uh, so when I got the invite to do this, it was an easy, easy yes. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. And I'd love it to be that as much as possible. You know, I, I have some slides I got to get through, obviously. But uh, as mentioned earlier, if there's if there's things that come up, uh, you know, I have my my teammate here, uh, Dr. Salka, that can monitor the chat box and, and we can have a discussion as much as possible. I have, uh, you know, some cases kind of scattered throughout this particular lecture. I'll give you some updates on what's going on in the cataract world. But really what this needs to be and what I want this to be focused on is, you know, what is the optometrist role in managing these patients from a preoperative standpoint understand kind of the the IOL options that are now available, which have changed uh, significantly in the last five to 10 years. And, you know, how do we manage patients postoperatively? What should we care about? And you'll see some of the cases that'll pop up and, and provide that as well. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. Uh, none of these really come into play throughout this particular lecture, but there are a few IOLs we talk about, and I do do some consulting with certain IOL companies, but we're going to be covering really all the new IOLs that will be kind of on the market. And I think this is kind of the premise and what we're going to, what we're going to cover from a cataract surgery standpoint. There's a lot of trends. There's a lot of changes over the last decade. We have new technology preoperatively, postoperatively, and even during the surgery, we have some great IOL technologies, and I do believe these IOL technologies have improved even in the last five years, and I'll touch on that. I think our patients have higher expectations, and that may be because of these new technologies that are coming out. It may be because they're talking to friends, they're talking to relatives that have maybe had some of these new IOL technologies and have had great outcomes. So they enter into our clinics and they start asking us about these different technologies, and they want it earlier than ever before. And then we'll talk a little bit about standard versus advanced cataract surgery. You know, in our practice, monofocal implants still serve a great purpose. I would tell you that 60% of the patients that I see still choose to do a standard monofocal implant and love to wear spectacle lenses and love to wear contact lenses. But for those patients that want some reduced dependence, that's really where these advanced cataract implant options come into play. And 35 to 40% of patients choose to do something like that with us to reduce some of that dependence. And I always say reduce because none of these technologies, as I get into this, really eliminate the need for the great spectacle options we have and the contact lens options we have. So it's a reduction, really. And you'll hear me say that multiple times kind of throughout this lecture. And we know that cataract surgery is not just rehabilitative surgery anymore. It's really turned into refractive surgery. And it's because of the expectations and the different IOLs that are occurring. Every day I have conversations with patients. They say, what can you do to reduce some of this dependence? And what can you do to maybe not have me wear glasses for reading or not have me wear glasses for distance vision? And so 
that is shifted and it's because of the technology that we're going to discuss here in a little bit. So let's begin kind of with the pre-operative considerations. Where does the cataract journey begin? What do we look for as we prepare ourselves or prepare our patients for cataract surgery? And I would answer the first question that says it, it really starts with us, with the optometrists. Uh, we're the ones that are providing the primary care. We're the ones that many patients seek out when they're having visual issues. We're the ones that have seen these patients for decades. We're the ones that see children. We see all these different types of patients and the cataract journey typically begins with us. And so it's very important we understand you know, the preoperative things around this. So what are the things we need to look for? Now, I'm not advocating you gotta have a fancy instrument like this particular OPD scan. But this provides us some really important information. And I'll touch on a few things here on this particular scan. Number one, corneal astigmatism. Uh, that is the key when we educate our patients around do they need to consider an astigmatism implant or not. And I'll get into those types of implants here in a little bit. I really don't care what their lenticular astigmatism is when we're talking about cataract surgery. We care about what's going on with the cornea because remember that lens is coming out. And so if they have corneal astigmatism, 0.75 or above, a discussion or at least a comment around a toric implant option should be discussed or an adjustable implant, which I'll touch on here in a little bit. You can see that labeled there on the left side. And we all have access to these things, right? Again, you don't need a fancy tomographer or topographer to be able to get corneal keratometry readings. You could get it with a manual K, but I bet most people on this call have some way to get corneal keratometry readings and that is important to start the discussion. I think the other thing that's important on this particular printout is the corneal high order aberrations. And that's down on your right side, right inferior portion there, in, in my view. Why I care about this, and again, there's a lot of instruments out there that can measure corneal high order aberrations, but why I care about this is it helps me formulate a discussion with a patient. If I see a number of 0.4 or above, my discussion about more advanced implants, specifically diffractive implants, meaning multifocal, trifocal, ones that split light, I'm going to be a little more diligent about that discussion about glare, about halos, those types of things. Does it mean they can't have it? No, but they need to understand because that corneal high order aberration, again, I have that circle there, the corneal high order aberration is what we care about. If that's above that 0 0.40, that RMS value, then that's concerning that they could suffer for some more glaring halos. To me, the rest of the information on here is probably not that important anymore. Angle kappa, you know, we say they're greater than 0.4, you avoid a multifocal. That's really old information. We now have gotten to a point where I rarely look at angle kappa. I rarely look at things that are, you know, where does the implant, you know, is it going to line up with, with the visual axis? If they have a high angle kappa, that's the worry that the optics of the implant aren't going to line up with where the patient is, is looking. And, you know, these technologies have gotten so good, as you'll see here in a little bit with contrast sensitivity, with the way that they work, that those really aren't a concern. The concerns to me are hydro aberrations and the way that we educate our patients. And I'm going to spend a whole section tonight on talking about the psychology around these implants and how do we need to talk to our patients? How do we need to educate them on there so we can set ourselves up for success with these advanced types of technology? So two take-homes from this slide. One, you care about the corneal astigmatism. 0.75 of corneal astigmatism or above, it's our job to at least mention a toric implant, just like you would mention a toric contact lens. And a patient that has high order aberrations that are significant 0.4 or above, it's worth having that discussion about glaring halos with those patients as well. Slow nap exam. This is more review, right? We want to take a look at the lids. We want to look at the cornea. We want to look at the lens, the vitreous. And we want to make sure that our patients don't have things like EBMD. That's what you're seeing in this particular image here. Why? Because it's going to affect the way that some of these implants work and function. And so we may need to treat these things on the front end. And the other reason is I'm in a referral practice. And I didn't state that earlier, but I, I don't do primary care in my practice. I do cornea evaluations, I do cataract evaluations, I do glaucoma evaluations. So when I see patients, they're referred in from colleagues, friends in the community for cataract evals or cornea evals or glaucoma evals. And so when I get a patient that comes in for a cataract evaluation and they've been well informed on what's going on with the health of the rise, meaning they know they have EBMD or they know they have some mild Fuchs dystrophy boy, the discussion's easier because what can be challenging is when these little things are missed because then it's my responsibility to make sure that I let them know 
that, hey, you have this small corneal dystrophy. The first question they ask me is, what do you think? They ask me, well, why didn't my doctor tell me about this? And even if you think it's minor, even if you think it's not going to affect how their cataract surgery goes, educate them on it. Talk to them about it. Let them know it's there. We may do nothing for it, but these things have to be at least discussed with your patients. This is advanced Fuchs dystrophy. This is an ECC. You know, your slit lamp exam can pick these things up. These aren't things you're going to probably miss, but we don't want to put a trifocal implant or a multifocal implant in an eye that has advanced Fuchs dystrophy or advanced EBMD. And we'll touch on some other things here as well. So my first polling question, what is one big concern and really why when we're examining patients, we cannot miss pseudo exfoliative syndrome? We got four choices here. Loose zonules, vitritis, corneal edema, or macular degeneration. This That's is such working, a, through it, working through it already. Perfect. This is such an important condition to catch on the front end. And although I only put one right answer up here, uh, there's a few other things we'll just briefly discuss as well. When you feel like there's enough there, Joe, you go ahead and launch the answers. I shall, I shall. They are coming in fast and furious. We like to get up to a certain amount. We're pretty close. Looks like they're hiding and down. So I'm going to end and share the results. Perfect. Very smart group already rolling on the polling questions. That's exactly right. So, you know, we can't miss this condition because we want to let our surgeons know that the patient has this particular condition. Now, we know there's a couple other things. Loose zonule is one. So the lens can be loose. One of the way that I like to look and see if the lens is loose, very simply, you're doing a slit lamp exam. You're looking, you identify the condition. I just tap I just tap the slit lamp. I'm looking to see, is that lens shimmering at all? Is that lens moving at all? So loose zonules. The other thing is, we want to take a look in the back of the eye. We need to look at the nerve. We need to check the pressure because exfoliative syndrome or pseudo exfoliative syndrome can cause high pressures, which can lead to glaucoma. So we want to do a thorough exam of that. And then finally, these patients don't dilate well. You get poor dilation with this particular condition. Another reason why we got to let our surgeons know so that they're aware that this condition exists. Will they catch it? Maybe, probably. But it's so nice when this is already documented, forwarded on, and you let your physicians know that you're working with. I think the other thing that is just so important is the dry eye evaluation. You know, we have to treat ocular surface disease. I don't care if it's a patient that's getting a monofocal implant. I don't care if it's patients getting a adjustable implant and a toric implant, a multifocal, any implant a patient gets, we need to address the ocular surface. And a common question that I get is, well, do I need to have all this technology? Do I need to have osmolarity testing? Do I need to have mybography? Do I need to have imaging? all these different things. And so I try to empower, you know, colleagues in the fact that, yeah, it's good to have those technologies. Do I have them? Yeah, I do have a lot of those technologies, but do you need them? No. What do I think you need? I think a questionnaire is huge. Uh, I don't care what type you use, to be honest with you. I personally use a speed questionnaire. Uh, I think it's easy to utilize and I like it because it gets the conversation started. It gets the conversation started around symptomology. We know that 50% of our patients though, don't have symptoms from dry eye, or they're at least not telling you about it. So we still have to do that exam, but 50% do have some symptomology. So having that questionnaire is, is, is crucial. That's one. Two, you got to have a slit lamp. I very I, I would venture to guess that everyone on here probably has a slit lamp. So you can take a look at the lids. You can take a look at the cornea. You can take a look at the meibomian glands. You have a slit lamp. You can do a pretty thorough dry eye evaluation. Number three, you got to have vital dyes. So sodium fluorescein staining, lysamine green staining, so helpful in looking at tear breakup time, tear meniscus. Is there a corneal staining? If I see staining like I do in this particular image, that means there's inflammation there. And if there's inflammation there, I'm going to treat that aggressively with either an immunomodulator or a topical cortical steroid. And number four, you need a digit, a thumb, an index finger. I don't care what it is so that you can press on the glands to be able to see what does that mybum look like? You're looking at identifying mybomian gland dysfunction. If you have these four things, I think you can begin treating dry eye at a pretty high level. 
The next things would be to add in some point of care testing if you wanted to, tear osmolarity, uh, inflammatory tests. I love my biography for patient education. I don't think it's necessary to manage my bulimia gland dysfunction, but it's great from a patient education standpoint. So I empower you all. These are the four things you really need to start managing patients with a dry eye. Add some other things to your arsenal as you go and you begin to treat these patients, but crucial preoperatively in order to make sure that we're getting the best outcomes after cataract surgery. And I kind of mentioned these additional technologies as well. Why is it important? Because the studies tell us so. Uh, I think most of us would agree that there is a high prevalence of ocular surface disease in our patient population, especially patients that are undergoing cataract surgery. You look at this particular study by Priya Gupta and her group. This was 120 patients in this particular study. You can see in the blue underline there that overall, 80% of the patients had at least one abnormal tear test. They looked at MMP9, so inflammatory biomarkers. They looked at osmolarity. They looked at corneal staining. And you can see that those percentages are high. And this is just in one study. There's other studies as well. There's the fake study from Bill Trattler. Uh, there's a variety of different studies that look at the fact that this is high prevalence in this particular patient population when they're walking into our clinic. This is that study I just mentioned, the FACO study, where a lot of these patients never complained, 60% of them never complained of a foreign body sensation. They never complained of having any type of symptomology, but 77% of these patients had positive corneal staining and 50% of them had central corneal staining on evaluation in the FACO study. So again, very prevalent, something that we definitely need to consider and manage. And then the macula, making sure that we don't see any abnormalities in the retina, a good thorough dilated fundus exam, leaning on our technologies where we can identify things like an epiretinal membrane, macular holes, glaucoma, those types of things. And I'll touch on glaucoma a little bit later with some of these IOL technologies as well, but just a thorough ocular examination on these types of patients. All right, so let's do a case here. Um, I Like I mentioned, I have a few of these kind of scattered throughout. So this was patient ER that came in and this patient was about 10 weeks post-surgery, uh, cataract surgery with a standard implant. And they present to you or they present it to me with blurred central vision that kind of occurred only in the right eye in this particular case. Best corrective visual acuity is about 2050 in that right eye. And this was on refraction as well. So doing refraction really couldn't make it any better. The pinhole couldn't improve it as well. Uh, on slit lamp and dilated fundus exam, you know, there was some posterior capsular pacification. Uh, just giving you the kind of number there, it was about one plus, okay? So about one plus PCO present. And then looking at the fundus, the, the vitreous, the nerve, the vessels all looked pretty normal. Uh, I guessed maybe there was some, maybe some mild macular thickening with a faint yellow spot in the fovea. Uh, if anyone wants to comment in the chat box, what would be your what would be your next step in this patient? Any other test you would want? You can even give me the first answer that pops up there, Joe. OCT. Oh, there it is. Someone jumped in with an OCT. I love it. That's what you get. So here's what you saw in fundus exam. Here's what your OCT looks like. That probably makes the diagnosis for most of us, right? Of what we're running into. So when we go back, you know, the history tells us a lot, right? 10 weeks out, you know, we see that they have a IOL, uh, blurred central vision in that eye, 2050 best corrected. If I see 2050 vision 10 weeks out and I can't improve it at all in a patient that has one plus PCO, yeah, you could blame a little bit on the PCO, but that 2050 vision, there's got to be something more going out on. And so... The biggest mistake you could make here is not taking a close look at the fundus, not dilating and not getting the OCT because this is manageable. So how do we manage this particular patient? We'll touch on that in a second, but clinical detection of macular edema or CME in this particular case, you have to do a fundus exam. You know, it's tough sometimes in subtle cases to pick up very mild CME. This was very obvious CME, right? There's a lot of swelling occurring here, but it does not always present this way. I've seen CME present many times with the patients 2025, 2030, and you can't quite get them to 2020. They're close, but they have this complaint of not having crisp, clear vision. So that is where your OCT comes into play. So your clinical evaluation, and then considering what you're going to get with the OCT. So management, yeah. 
you know, Justin, we probably miss a lot of it because the way you just described that 2025 acuity, I can tell you a lot of my patients, they, they hit 2025 basic cataract extraction, acrylic implant, monovision, no glasses. Oh, they're, they're, they're happy. <laughs> they, we, we don't, we don't even really look for it. I completely agree. And that those are the ones that are missed. Right. And mm -hmm. thankfully you can see on this slide here, a lot of them do spontaneously resolve. Uh, some do, you know, that patient we just saw that needs treatment. That's likely not going to spontaneously resolve. And I'm not advocating that at the three month mark, everyone should get an OCT done. Uh, that's not probably what I would recommend, but I would be suspicious if you see your patient at their three month post-op check and their ocular health is very normal looking and you're not able to get a nice crisp, clear image quality because then you're thinking dry eye, you're thinking PCO or you're thinking CME. Those are the things that come in mind. I work from back to front in those types of patients. So treating this particular patient, as I mentioned, this patient's probably not going to spontaneously resolve. How do we manage a patient like this? I typically incorporate both topical cortical steroids as well as NSAIDs. And so my typical dosage for this is a cortical steroid QID or every four hours, um, you know, throughout the day. So QID on the topical steroid. And a lot of times I will do a once a day NSAID. I'll do it twice a day. So that would be like an Ilevro or a, um, you know, there, there a, there's a bunch of them out there that are once a day. You could do Ketorolac as well. Uh, Ketorolac, I would dose maybe a little bit higher, but an NSAID, I'll typically do twice a day, top cortical steroid, QID. And then I usually will see these patients back in two to four weeks to see how they're doing. If I am not seeing improvement in two to four weeks, then I'm suspicious that there's something more going on in the retina. And I'll share a story with you of why I'm more, I'm suspicious about that. I've had a few patients where they've come in, they're three to four weeks post cataract surgery. And this has only happened a few times or, or uh, once or twice. And I made the diagnosis, boy, they have CME. No, no big deal. Put them on the, the cortical steroid four times a day, put them on the head said twice a day, see them back a month later. And the CME looks no better. Take a closer look at the fundus exam. They have a small, or they did have a small, and it's still present, branch retinal vein occlusion. And so the reason that they had the CME, the, the macular edema was not CME truly in its form. It was actually a very small branch retinal vein occlusion that caused some macular edema. And I made a misdiagnosis. I made a misdiagnosis, but the good thing is you just didn't settle for it. You just didn't assume that, well, CME, stay stubborn, keep treating them with what you're doing. It's going to get better. Investigate further because these patients, if it's true CME, will respond fairly quickly to a treatment that you're seeing right in front of you now. All right. So goals. I think this is so crucial when we start getting into the IOL technology and we start talking to our patients about the different technology. The first question I wanna know with my patients is what are your goals? And we have an intake form that fills that, they could fill it out. I will honestly tell you, I rarely look at it. Uh, some of our other doctors probably do. I actually ask the patients, I wanna hear them tell me, you know, what are your goals? Cause if it's a patient that loves their spectacle lenses or really wants to continue wearing contact lenses or really wants to take their glasses off only for reading and they're perfectly fine with wearing their glasses for far away, or they're perfectly fine with wearing glasses for reading, but they don't want to wear anything far away. I want to hear them verbalize that to me. So I keep it very simple. I just ask them, what are your goals and do you mind wearing glasses? And if they tell me, I don't mind wearing glasses, then I get into a conversation around monofocal technology. I start asking them, do you want to wear them for reading or far? I still educate them on the other types of technologies but I try to keep it fairly simple. Number one, not to confuse them, but, but number two, so that I understand what their goals are as well, because I think the goals around these are so crucial in order to make the right decision for our patients. When we talk about age. I mean, I see patients now younger than ever coming in for cataract surgery, and this does at time create some problems, uh, to be completely honest with you. We all would probably agree that a 50 year old still has some accommodative ability. We know that a 45 year old has some accommodative ability. Now, are they losing some of it? Yes. When they have their natural lens, they still have some accommodative ability. And the challenge occurs 
when we look at young patients undergoing cataract surgery is if they ultimately choose not to do a more advanced implant, and let's say, for example, they choose to do a monofocal implant, uh, we have to have the discussion around what's going to occur to their near vision. It's going to be much different than what their natural lens is, especially in that younger patient undergoing cataract surgery. Because again, a 45-year-old still has some ability to accommodate. As soon as we put that implant in the eye, that accommodation is gone. We've taken them to complete presbyopia. So reassuring or having that discussion around that. And then just talking to them about the different IOL technologies. And I'm going to get deeper into that here in a minute. The different types of patients that walk in. I put this up here because the myop, the myop is a patient that you'll make it, you'll make the mistake one time where you won't talk about what's going to happen to their near vision and you won't make that mistake again. Uh, you know, you'll have that minus three patient that their whole life they've worn glasses for distance. Uh, but as soon as they hit their mid forties or their upper fit or early fifties, they slip their glasses off to do everything up close. Then they go undergo cataract surgery and your surgeon nails that 2015, 2020 distance vision with a monofocal implant, but they can't read anything up close. And if we didn't educate them, they are the most unhappiest patient on the face of the earth. Those are myopic patients. Got to have the discussion around that. Hyperopic patients. I love hyperopic patients for advanced technology. They've never been able to see up close very well. They eventually don't see good far away. They are ideal patients for a trifocal type of technology because you're going to provide them with the best near vision that they've ever had in their life. A lot harder with a myop, much easier with hyperope. So when I see a hyperope and they're interested in reducing their dependence on their glasses, I'm usually smiling because I feel very, very confident we're going to get them to a good spot. And then astigmats. We'll talk about some different technology here as well. I touched a little bit on this already as I talked about goals on that first slide there. But remember, there's patients that still want to do that monovision type of technology or monovision setup. Keep in mind that monovision after cataract surgery is a lot different than monovision in a patient that's using contact lenses with their natural lens. I mentioned earlier, a lot of times with their natural lens, they still have some accommodative ability. The setup isn't exactly the same. And so I'm, I'm careful in my education around that post cataract monovision correction. I'll be completely honest. I steer them typically clear of that now, mainly because of the technologies we're going to talk about here in a little bit. I just think if I can provide a patient with a technology that's going to let them see fairly well at distance with both eyes, maybe give them some intermediate, even some near with both eyes, they're going to be a lot happier than with just monovision. Now, if it's a patient that's been monovision their whole life and they request it, I don't have a problem with it. I just educate thoroughly. Remember these near point target patients that just don't want to wear glasses for near there's tons of them out there. And then there's patients that don't want to wear at distance, but are fine with reading glasses. It all goes back to education. And we'll get into that here in a little bit. All right, current options. So I'm going to take you through really all the different technologies that are out there right now. We have monofocal implants. We have some extended monofocal implant vision types. Uh, there's accommodative implants that are being researched right now. I'll touch on those. Uh, multifocals have been around for a long time. We have extended depth of focus. Extended depth of vision is another term you may hear. We have trifocal IOLs that are on the market now. And then we do have a light adjustable lens that I'll get into as well that's on the market too. So we talk about toric lenses. We have a variety of these approved right now. You could see three different companies here with three different toric implants. I mentioned earlier, the discussion for me around these implants happens when I see around 0.75 amounts of corneal astigmatism or more. I have a conversation with patients about it. I want them aware that they have the ability, if they want to, to be corrected with this technology. Uh, another technology that's not on here, but I'm going to get into it, is there is an adjustable implant that corrects astigmatism as well. Uh, and so we'll touch on that as well. So it's not in this particular category, but it, but it also falls under the category of correcting astigmatism. So when we think about toric lenses, uh, there can be problems with them. And I think the challenge with these are the residual pieces of astigmatism. And as optometrists, we're going to see these patients postoperatively. And so I do want to spend a little bit of time on how do we troubleshoot this residual astigmatism that we run to when these patients come back to our practice, they've paid X amount of dollars and they may not be 100% happy. They may not be 100% happy because of that residual astigmatism. Where did it come from? It could come from a slight lens rotation. Uh, it can come from uh, 
you know, uh, the wrong eye, meaning these patients maybe have some dryness or they have an underlying corneal dystrophy, but there's a way to fix those things. These lenses can be rotated. There's laser fine tunes. Uh, there's incisions in the cornea sometimes, and obviously glasses or contacts, which typically are a last resort if it's a patient that paid some money for these particular technologies. So let's spend some time on this. Residual astigmatism. Where does it come from? Why does it occur? Well, from our end, I'm going to shift you right over to the wrong eye. I mentioned this earlier. Let's make sure that it doesn't get put in the wrong eye by us doing the pre-work on this, meaning ocular surface disease. Make sure we're treating dryness on the front end, because if we treat dryness and we send the patient to the cataract surgeon with a pristine surface, the chances that these implants are going to work will be better, and there's a less likely chance we get residual astigmatism. EBMD, corneal dystrophies, irregular astigmatism. So being a detective to looking for, is there any irregularities? We want to treat these diseases or not allow our patient to even get the technology if it happens to be the wrong eye. When we get to the wrong location, wrong lenses, I put that more on the surgery center. Uh, being in a surgery center myself, you know, I pride myself on making sure that we're getting accurate measurements, that we're getting measurements that are going to not allow my surgeon to put it in the wrong location and that we're not putting the wrong lens in the eye because of improper calculations. So as an optometrist in the community, I would say the job there is ocular surface treatment, look for disease, make sure that an implant is even allowed to go in the eye because of those things. And then for me being in a surgical center, my job is to make sure that these lenses, the calculations are all done properly and we're putting it in the right location. So postoperatively, how do we manage these patients? So let's say you get a patient that comes back and they have some toric misalignment. And I put this graph in here to show you guys that just even a little bit of misalignment can really throw these patients off. Yeah. So you're seeing two types of toric lenses here. You're seeing a T3 lens and you're seeing a T9 lens. This is the amount of corneal astigmatism that's being corrected. If you look at the misalignment, even if they're misaligned, say the implant rotated even 10 degrees, you can see the amount of doctors lost with a T3 or a T9, you know, almost a doctor and a half on a T9 patient. Now let's just say that lens rotates 30 degrees. Might as well not even have a torque lens in the eye. There's a hundred percent loss of correction of the astigmatism. 15 degrees, you lose half of what it's supposed to be doing. And so it doesn't take a lot of misalignment to create a problem. There's an app on your iPhone, or, or it may be Android too, but there's an app called Access Assistant. I have it on my phone. I use it post-operatively with torque lenses all the time. So let's say, for example, you have a patient come in and they're at their one month post-op visit. You refract them. You're finding some residual astigmatism. You're finding an adapter, adapter and a half of residual astigmatism. What you need to do is dilate the patient. And on every torque lens, I'm going to back up here, you're going to see, and you can see it in this image. I'm not sure if my cursor's working. Let me see if I can get the pointer going here. There we go. You'll see these three little lines, and that's where it should line up at. That's the axis in that particular situation. So what you're going to do with your axis assistant is you're going to have the patient dilated. You're going to put them behind the slit lamp. You're going to take your slit beam. You make it very, very narrow, and then you're able to turn that slit beam so that it aligns perfectly with those three dots. Okay, so you wanna align it whichever way it may be here, it might be here. Have the patient stay in the slit lamp and align that with that narrow slit beam. Then have the patient sit back, take your phone, and you'll have this particular image that you're seeing over here, right here in this app. You're able to use these plus and minus signs to swing that back and forth line that up with the beam, line this up with the slip beam that you just have, and you'll know precisely where that implant is lining up. You'll get hopefully a post-operative report from the surgeon. You can know where that implant is supposed to sit. And for example, if you measure 64 and it was supposed to be at 90, you know that that implant isn't working. And that patient very likely at a month should go back to the surgeon for either an IOL rotation they may want to wait and just do a fine tune, but you at least can educate the patient that the implant is likely rotated out of access. So this is really helpful from an educational standpoint. It helps to troubleshoot what your next steps are. And it's a simple app and it takes, you know, a dilation and a very quick use of your slit lamp exam. Hey, Justin, uh, 
Uh, here's a question for you. What if you get in postoperatively one of those poor dilators, you can't see the uh, the hash marks? Yeah, and, and that can happen. I, I completely agree. And, and if you can't see the marks, it, you're not going to be able to do this. I would urge you then to, you know, try a couple dilate and drops, dilate a few times. But yeah, that's challenging when it's a poor dilator and you can't see the haptic marks. It can be challenging. Now, I will tell you, you don't have to see all three of them. If you can even find one of them, if you can even find one of them, you can do a pretty good job of guessing. Okay, if I see that one there, remember they're perpendicular to one another. You're going to be able to line that up and be able to find that. So if you can even catch one of these, you'll be able to pull it off. Even this, you know, tip of the of the one here. I turned my pointer off. Even if you can catch the one up here or the one here, you're going to know the other one is just directly across from it. And by the way, Justin, your 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 uh, your cursor works. I mean, it shows up. The, your arrow shows up nicely. Okay, that is perfect. Then I don't need to go back and forth. Thank you for letting you me know that because that will make it much easier. And then the final piece to this, of course, is laser fine tunes. So some surgeons will prefer just to do a laser fine tune. That's their magic eraser rather than rotating the implant. I'll tell you, if if we get these patients in our practice with toric implants, residual astigmatism, in a month we'll rotate it typically. I'd rather leave the cornea alone if all possible. My surgeon would rather leave the cornea alone if at all possible. Uh, if it gets beyond three months, three months and beyond, will he still rotate? He may, he may do it. We take a look at the implant closely and decide if it's going to be an easy rotation or not. Because our goal ultimately is if we can leave the cornea untouched, that's always an advantage in doing these uh, situations with these types of patients. So let's review some of the implants. So this is an implant called I. I hands. Uh, this is an implant that is considered a monofocal implant, but the really nice thing about it is it does provide a little bit of enhanced vision for intermediate. Now, this is not a lens that you would tell a patient, boy, you're going to be able to read great with. It's not what it's for. I wouldn't even tell a patient that they'll be able to function necessarily on a computer, but some of these patients will be able to look at their phones if they stretch their arms out. I know that some practices are actually using this lens as their traditional standard monofocal implant because it enhances or advances, provides a little extended depth of focus for these patients. Now, keep in mind, there's no rings, no refractive rings with it. So the amount of glare and halos, those types of things are, are almost non-existent. Uh, it behaves just like a monofocal implant. It just provides maybe a little more in their clinical trials intermediate vision compared to a standard monofocal implant. This just looks at the defocus curve. You'll see a few of these from me tonight. Uh, I apologize. It gets a little bit nerdy, but I think it's important because it shows how well these technologies work at different distances. Uh, what you see in the green there is the technology that we just talked about. In the red is a standard monofocal implant. Remember, I just mentioned that it enhances that near slightly. And you can see when you look at this defocus curve, this would be at infinity. So that means looking at distance, they perform about the same, okay? This is as you would essentially think about it as bringing the reading material closer to you. Each one of these steps, closer, closer, closer. So, you know, 50 centimeters or so, 40 centimeters or so, that's what this is showing here. So that's a defocus curve. And so you can see that the monofocal implant drops off pretty quickly, which we'd expect. That doesn't provide really any near where this enhanced implant doesn't drop off quite as quickly, but it provides some near. It's why we don't promise near with this lens, but it provides a little bit of enhanced vision up close. This is an extended depth of focus lens, been on the market for quite some time. This is called the Symphony. Uh, I think many of you are familiar with this. Uh, I would still educate on glare and halos with this particular lens, as you can see by the design of it over here. This can create the most traditional one is a spider web glare and halo. If a patient has a spider web glare and halo, that's what they're complaining about. And they have a Technus symphony. It, it, it's almost always coming from the implant. Uh, that creates some challenges. So I educate on that still. This is a great lens for intermediate vision, for distance vision. We're going to look at the defocus curve here in a second. Extended depth of focus lens doesn't necessarily, you know, split light. When we look here, technus monofocal versus a technus multifocal versus an extended depth of focus, you can see how this particular lens works. A multifocal, you have two distinct foci. It's splitting light. You get a distance focal point. You get a near focal point. With the symphony, 
it elongates. So it extends that depth of focus. There's not specifically one near focal point. You have distance, but now you have a little bit of range of vision up close. That's the advantage of this particular lens. This is an overlay. Again, I apologize. I told you I'd get a little bit nerdy tonight on these defocus curves. Here is another one. This is a, a bunch of different implants in the Technus family. When we look at this, you have what's called the Zambu. This one is really meant for near vision. Okay, the Zelbu. These are the ad powers, essentially, the ZK boo, and then the ZC boo is their monofocal. Again, with the defocus curve zero, meaning infinity, all these lenses should traditionally behave the same way at distance. So that's what you're seeing there. If we look at the monofocal implant at 50 centimeters, drops off the table for near. That's what we'd expect with a monofocal implant. Let's look at the ZM boo. What does it do? It's more powerful or better at that 33 centimeter area, but look what happens at 50 centimeters. It may not work quite as well. You have the Z elbow here. It's more advantageous at about 42 centimeters, not as good here. And the ZK being more advantageous at about 50 centimeters. So one thing I will say with these types of lenses, you're able to kind of listen to your patient and target what you want them to use. Now, I'm getting even more nerdy here. Hang on. I'm going to overlay the Symphony EDOF on top of all these other ones. And now look at what the Symphony is doing. So Symphony at distance, really, really good. As you bring that reading material in, it's at its best in this intermediate range. And then it slowly begins to drop off as that reading material gets closer and closer. Why do I bring this up? I bring it up because a lot of times these lenses are mixed and matched meaning a lot of patients will get a symphony in their dominant eye and maybe a ZL boo in their non-dominant eye. Well, why would we do that? We would do that because we're giving them good distance vision. The symphony is covering this range of vision. And when the symphony drops off, look what the ZL boo does. It picks up. It picks up that 42 centimeter range right here. And so there's a lot of mixing and matching that can occur with these types of implants. I will admit we don't do as much of this anymore. This is all we used to do five years ago until we got trifocal technology. And that to me has really changed the game of what we're doing. And we'll talk about a couple of those implants in a second. In another extended vision lens or extended depth of focus lens, this is called Vividity from Alcon. This does not split light rays. Uh, it's really designed for both near intermediate and distance. What I will tell you when we look at the defocus curve, it does a really, really nice job for distance, a really nice job for intermediate. The downside is the near vision, but the beauty of it is no splitting of light rays. So you don't run into glaring halos. Here's that defocus curve again, distance vision here. Okay. In the blue is that extended depth of focus lens. You can see it does a nice job at intermediate at 66 centimeters. Starts to be okay at 50 centimeters. You get to 40 centimeters. It really drops off in comparison to a monofocal. So again, what are the advantages of something like this? If you have a patient that doesn't want glare and halo, they care about distance, but they want some intermediate vision, a really nice lens for consideration in those patients. All right, the light adjustable lens. So this is a special technology. Uh, this is a technology that, that we are utilizing in our practice. I will preface with saying that uh, the way that it works is fascinating. It's accurate. It's probably the most accurate implant on the market. I think the hardest part about this particular lens is the workflow. Uh, and I'll go through a little bit of that with you. But until you get your workflow down in a surgical practice with this particular implant, it can be challenging. And I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what the you know, the, the referring optometrist role in is on this and, and can they have this technology and can they have the instrument to adjust? You sure can. Uh, you know, we have a, we have a doctor in our area that refers to us plenty that has this particular technology where, where we do the surgery and, and, and they do the adjustment. So what is this lens? What's special about it? Well, number one, it has these regular silicone polymers, but it has these mobile silicone subunits that are photosensitive. So those macromers are within the lens, they're photosensitive. And so we make adjustments, essentially just changing the radius of curvature of the lens. Here's how it works. The patient undergoes standard cataract surgery. 
for about 17 to 21 days, they're just healing. And so the patient will undergo cataract surgery. They come back to you for your one day visit. They come back to you for the one week visit. You're doing your traditional post-operative care with this patient at around that month mark, 21 days or so, you go ahead and do a refraction. In our area, if you have this light delivery system that you're able to adjust the implant, you're able to do an adjustment at that point in time. If you don't have it, you'd send the patient back to the surgeon. You'd send it back to me. Uh, I do the adjustments in our practice. So this is something that optometrists can do. It's just delivering light to the implant. The patient has to have a dilated pupil. It has to be seven millimeters or greater. So if they don't dilate seven millimeters or greater, then they can't have this technology. This light delivery system, based on the refraction that was done, is then applied to the lens. And all that's happening is this polymerization and a modified shape or a change in the radius of curvature. You're able to correct myopia, residual myopia, residual hyperopia, astigmatism. Per treatment, it states you can correct up to minus two diopters of residual astigmatism. In my experience, you don't get it all in one treatment. These patients can have three treatments. So the lens is photosensitive for up to three treatments. And then they typically need two lock-ins. So it's a total of five treatments for these patients. Each treatment takes roughly two minutes. The other thing I will tell you is these patients, before they're locked in, they have to wear photosensitive glasses. So when they're outside, they have to have these particular glasses that are provided to them at the surgical practice. They have to wear them when they're outside at all times until they're locked in so that the lens doesn't change from the UV light. When they're inside, they don't have to wear anything. Uh, that it's not necessary inside. There is a coating on the lens that provides some UV protection, but when they're outside, they should have them on. Seeing if any questions pop up at all, Joe, on this. Usually there is, so I just was going to pause. Uh, nothing has come up about this. You know, we are, we are doing this in our practice that is labor intensive. You're right about that. We typically is, have uh, ODs uh, doing doing these uh, lock-ins. It, it is. You, you have to get your workflow down. Um, I would be you know, not fair telling the whole story around that. Now, is it precise? It works beautifully well, but uh, you have to have your workflow down when you're, when you're doing this. This is me performing. That's the, the system. Um, this is what your view is when you're looking at at doing a treatment. You have a nice dilated pupil here. You focus on the haptics when you're doing the treatment. Uh, there's a foot pedal. So the, the technician will hit ready and you depress the foot pedal and it provides UV light to the lens. You have an align assistant as well. That'll let you know if you're not aligned correctly throughout the process. But the key is we're all capable of this. You just focus on those um, haptics, keep those in focus throughout the treatment. This is the active treatment occurring. This is what it looks like. Um, system is ready. I haven't depressed the pedal yet. I wouldn't want to depress the pedal because do those look clear, those haptics? No. So I get those in focus and then I'll go ahead and press it. Then you use a gonial mirror. So you're putting a gonial mirror on the eye so that you're able to focus very clearly when you're doing this. Justin, a question did come in. And yeah. the question is, what is the most challenging part of this? I would tell you the most challenging part of this is not doing the treatments. The most challenging part of it is making sure that you do the treatments when you should be doing them, meaning that you want to get a very good, crisp, clear refraction before you start doing treatments. And a lot of times this lens is being used in post-refractive patients. We do it in patients that have had previous RK. And you don't want to do a treatment until the ocular surface is pristine and until you're getting a really nice refraction where that patient tells you, oh, I like that vision. That to me is the most challenging part, the decision-making around it. I'll tell you, doing the treatment itself is not challenging. Yeah, that is the uh, that is the word. It, another question has come in. Are any particular patients you wouldn't use this for aside from the poor dilators? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't correct irregular astigmatism. And so, you know, no implant does that. So if I have a patient that has, you know, something that looks like pellucid or, or keratoconus, you know, that I can't identify, you know, regular astigmatism, uh, I'm not going to do that on that patient. And I think patients that have any ocular health issues. Now, 
I've done it on patients that have a couple guttata. I'm not really worried because it's a monofocal implant still. And so if I don't think that those guttata are going to create a problem for that patient, I would do that. Uh, but I'm careful in any patient with an epiretinal membrane or previous, you know, retinal surgeries, uh, they have a bad corneal dystrophy, uh, excessive dry eye. If we don't think we can manage it, you know, those are patients where I still would be, you know, be careful with it. I treat it still, you know, like I would a, a trifocal type of implant. Now you mentioned you mentioned these patients, uh, the ocular surface. Uh, what about the commenting going back a little further back, the capsule? Yeah. So what's interesting about this lens is you don't see a lot of PCO with it. Uh, you do get some, but you don't see a lot of it, which is which is kind of interesting. I will do adjustments with a little bit of PCO as long as my refraction is clear as long as I'm getting the patient to 2020, we'll, we'll do the adjustments. If I can't get the patient to 2020, then a lot of times we will do a little earlier EAG capsulotomy than we normally would. So a lot of times we're doing EAG capsulotomies at about three months. We'll try to push that patient a month and a half to two months, and then we'll do a EAG if I can't get a crisp, clear refraction. Uh, because if you're doing adjustments on an inaccurate refraction, and it's probably not your fault, it's the patient just isn't seeing clearly then you're just wasting those adjustments. The whole goal of this lens too is to avoid having to fine tune or touch up the cornea. That's why a lot of times patients choose this lens. Well, we're defeating the purpose if we're not getting crisp, clear refractions. Yeah, it, our, our protocol is if we if we see any significant, significant degrees of PCO, that they get yagged uh, sooner rather than later. And another question or comment comes in, and uh, I, I see I see their point. It seems like all a bit much for all parties, given the fact that the majority of patients are content with the results of conventional cataract surgery. That's there, Justin? Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you guys heard me say it right at the beginning. It, it, it's a, it, we got to know their goals, right? And so the question needs to be, are you happy with your spectacle lenses and contact lenses? If they are, great then my job and our job, all of our jobs is to just educate them on their options. Uh, at least they know about it. Right. And, and so uh, I just think that if we don't talk to them about these options, we're not fully doing what our obligation is, which is to provide options for our patients. That doesn't mean you sell any of these technologies. I'm going to get into that in the psychology of things here in a little bit. I am not a salesman. That's not what I want to do. I want to be a doctor. I want to educate my patients to the best of my knowledge but I don't want to sell it. And so your comment is is spot on. If the patient is perfectly fine with spectacle lenses or, or contact lenses, um, it may not be worth their time to go through all of this. Yeah, we, we like to use it in patients who we can kind of anticipate there may be a refractive surprise afterwards. You know, the people who have had previous corneal surgery, refractive surgery, and we don't know what uh, they were preoperatively, you can have a refractive surprise it's a little bit easier to fix than, uh, than swapping out an IOL. Completely agree. Post-refractive patients typically don't want to go back into glasses or contacts. They had refractive surgery for a reason. Now they're at cataract surgery. Uh, this to me is the go-to lens for those types of patients be, for, for that particular reason. And because you don't have to touch their cornea again, that's the goal, that you don't have to do another refractive procedure on them. Trifocality, let's touch on this. And then there's just a couple extra IOLs that are in the pipeline. And then we'll get to kind of the, the, the fun stuff on some other cases and, and the psychology around these things. Trifocality has really changed the game, in my opinion. Uh, you still have to talk to patients about dysphotopsies. You still have to talk to them about glaring halos. But these types of lenses are providing patients with, you know, distance vision, intermediate vision, and even some near vision. And they've gotten better. They're better than multifocality in even their contrast sensitivity and those types of things. And that's been shown in their particular studies. One that's out there right now uh, is right here. Uh, this is called Panoptics. This is a trifocal technology. Again, you can see the defocus curve on the bottom there. Again, providing good distance vision. You get a intermediate vision. You get a near vision with this as well. Again, you have to educate on glare and halos. You can see those three foci, trifocal with a 40 centimeter, 60 centimeter, and distance. And this light allocation, these are the things that are changing with these lenses and why patients do better and better of it. 50% available light at, at distance, 25 and 25 at intermediate and at near. And then you have this particular lens, the Technus Synergy, 
which is really a combination of an EDOF lens. We talked about that earlier and a multifocal. So I don't know if I should call it a trifocal or not. There's different names for it, but really the goal around it is to provide distance, intermediate and near. And so this particular lens, in my opinion, provides a little bit better near vision than what Panoptics does. Panoptics, in my experience, provides a little better distance vision than this particular lens. And again, that's why I love these types of technologies, because you're able to match the technology to what the patient's goal is. If it's a patient that wants to see great up close and is okay with giving a little at distance, this may be the technology, but it goes back to the education around that. So again, we have a technology here similar to panoptics that really is providing us three different distances. This is just looking at that defocus curve. Again, you can see the clinical trial data here that 92% of patients reported not wearing glasses across all distances. It goes back to the point 92%, meaning that these lenses, when you talk to patients about them, it's to reduce the dependence on lenses. We're not eliminating it. If I hear a patient say perfect, or I want to get out of glasses hundred percent, we have a thorough discussion. The goal here is not complete elimination. All right, so let's talk about a few that are in the pipeline. So this is a modular IOL system. Again, not FDA approved. This is not available yet at this point in time. What's really interesting about this is the cataract surgery is done. There's a base implant put in that's in the capsular bag. And then there's a removable optic that can be put in. And so this goes back to a point that, that Joe mentioned earlier. You know, sometimes when you get a refractive surprise, that's why we like that adjustable lens. What's interesting about this is if you get a refractive surprise, instead of having to do surgery, they can remove the eye well and put a, put a new one in. So it's a modular implant. And so you're able to optimize that with, with, with um, how the patient's outcome may be, or you have a disappointed patient because you didn't hit the mark. This is a modular implant being studied on the market right now. This is an approved implant. I should really move this forward now. Uh, this is the IC8. This is the only lens in the market that can actually correct irregular astigmatism. And why do I say that? Not because the lens is actually correcting anything on the surface of the eye, because it's a pinhole effect. And so because it's a pinhole effect, it technically correct some irregular astigmatism. All you're doing with this lens is it's placed in the non-dominant eye. The other eye gets a traditional monofocal implant or an adjustable implant or whatever they want the other eye. This is placed in the non-dominant eye. And so can it be used to normalize? Yes, but it can also be used in post-RK, keratoconus, post-LASIK, anything with irregular astigmatism. It's something that can be considered as well. Again, you're just getting a pinhole effect. You're trying to bring patients' vision better up close. We were part of the FDA clinical trial on this, and I could tell you uh, surprising results with it. I was a little bit skeptical, uh, but it does a really decent job of giving patients uh, some very, very usable up-close vision and with the other eye being kind of that dominant eye, they get distance vision in their dominant eye. They actually get pretty decent distance vision through this lens as well. And then there's a bunch of accommodating implants. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly for the sake of time so we can get to kind of some of the cases. Um, there's really three different accommodating implants being looked at. And, you know, accommodating implants would be kind of the holy grail because it would make patients be like they were before they had cataract surgery or before the age of 40. But these have created challenges. You know, the crystal lens was on the market and, and is still out there, but not utilized very often. Uh, they're working at different ones here. This one actually has two pieces to it. Again, it has a base and it has a modular piece. Uh, it really changes based on where the patient is looking and how the zonules work. There's these liquid based ones as well being looked at. This is from fluid vision, uh, depending on, again, where the patient's looking based on how their, their zonules move, fluid either enters the haptics or comes out of the haptics, which then changes the radius of curvature of the lens. Again, not FDA approved being looked at. And then this one's a shifting optics one as well. It has two piece sulcus IOL fixed and variable again, early in the, in, in studies right now, uh, but is providing some accommodative range. And I would love to see one of these get approved to be on the market. Cause again, I think it would make our patients back to their more natural IOL type of technology. And then there's another trifocal one being looked at as well. That's out there and available. So that is kind of the review of the different implants. We're going to have back-to-back -back polling questions to kind of get everyone awake again. So here's polling question number two, which of the patients below would be best suited for an EDOF or extended vision IOL. That 68-year-old female who enjoys needle pointing 
three hours per day. That 64-year-old female who loves wearing her glasses. An 82-year-old male who has moderate AMD. Or a 74-year-old retired male who enjoys golfing four days a week. And Justin, let me, I don't think, I don't recall hearing you mention uh, in terms of the uh, the multifocal lenses and people who want to get out of the glasses, you got to be very careful. They're not, they're not wearing prism in their glasses currently. Yeah, great point. You know, and in our exam sheet, our, mm -hmm. our my technicians, we have a spot right on there that, you know, they check every pair of spectacle lenses that come in. We get a note from every referring doctor and there's a, there's a, there's a spot we check off that says, you know, prism or no prism. Um, because when I see prism, it, it changes the discussion immediately. Uh, if it says no prism, then everything's open as long as everything else is healthy. So thank you. That's important. Yeah, I, I had, I had a very, very nice gentleman who underwent uh, pre premium surgery and afterwards he developed the sagging eye syndrome and horizontal double vision. So he ended up with a pair of prism glasses and, yeah, nope. the, the the result was great. It just said he developed double vision afterwards. And you know, that's what led us to put that on the chart, actually, Joe, because we got we got burned on that one time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've I do a pretty good job of paying attention, but it's a lot easier if it's on the chart and it can get checked off mm -hmm. and it slipped oh, through. Yeah, he, it slipped yeah, through. This fellow this fellow was not wearing uh not wearing prism. This is something that developed uh after cataract surgery. Several months later he's having a horizontal double vision sagging eye syndrome. Ugh. Well, there are your results. There's the results. Yeah, great. Yeah, I mean, D is, is you know, that 70%. Great job. That someone that he enjoys golfing four days a week, uh, he'll probably be able to look at his scorecard still. Uh, he'll be able to do those types of things. Remember, extended depth of focus or extended vision lenses, really nice for distance, you know, minimal glare and halo, probably will do a decent job for intermediate, typically falls a bit short for near uh, I wouldn't say B's a wrong answer, but if she tells me she loves wearing her glasses, you know, I'm not going to sell her anything. I'm going to educate her and she may ultimately choose it, but I won't sell her. So I guess B is probably not a wrong answer either. And, uh, you know, I've, we put these lenses in AMD patients, but it has to be very, very mild. I'd be careful with a moderate AMD patient. So great. Thank you. Let's go to polling question number three. I believe that is next. I'll get it up on my side. Joe launched his. All right. So Here's a patient that presents for cataract surgery pre-op and it's discovered upon your dilated fundus exam. She has an ERM causing some mild macular pucker. Okay. So very mild macular pucker. V is correctable to 2030. Which of the font LOLs would be the poorest choice based on this patient's macular condition? So poorest choice out of those. You may say they're all poor choices, but one of them is probably more poor than the rest. And Justin, we're we're all we're all caught up on the chat, so I think we're good there. Great. Appreciate you moderating that. Boy, it makes things no worries. smooth. So I will say with this question, you know, EDOF extended depth lenses, um, you know, extended vision lenses. Uh, I don't eliminate those if it's a patient that's motivated with a really real mild ERM. I'm careful, but but I've done that before, and we don't have that up there for an option. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is, that's exactly, we, we, we want to be careful with the lens that's splitting light. So a multifocal lens, remember, is going to split light. You know, if we have retinal pathology, I would be extremely hesitant to put that in the eye. Uh, you know, a monofocal implant, I'd be okay with. They're going to probably wear spectacle lenses anyways. You just got to educate them on the e ERM. Uh, IC8, I would consider it. I would consider it because remember, there's no splitting of light with that. It's just extending the depth of focus in the non-dominant eye. And the crystal lens really is a monofocal implant. That's how it behaves. It's an accommodative implant. It's a monofocal implant. And so the last three you could consider, you still have to educate that they have some retinal pathology and they're probably not going to come out of this with, you know, 2015 or 2020 pristine vision. But you got to be really careful with these splitting light lenses when there's any pathology present. And it's probably not good to uh, increase their expectations and decrease their uh, their savings account by having to pay extra because now they're going to be unhappy, I think. I completely agree. 
This is probably one of my favorite sections uh, of this lecture. I love talking about this psychology around these advanced implants. And the reason why is it's kind of what, what I do as the optometrist. I'm not the one and, and what you guys do too. We're not we're not inside the eye, right? We're not taking a cataract out. We're not putting the implant in. You know, that's what the surgeon does. But I love thinking about you know the psychology around these particular implants and trying to find out, well, why is the patient unhappy? And so many, many times you'll have a patient come in that maybe 2020 but they're unhappy and we have to figure out why, because what we can't say to them is, well, Hey, you're seeing 2020 go home. You know, everything looks great. We can't say that to them. If they're unhappy, we need to figure out, well, why are they unhappy? What are the reasons behind it? And so there's a lot of times six reasons, or it doesn't mean they have all these reasons, but this was a study that looked at, you know, what are the six main reasons why a patient may be unhappy in your chair? Well, refractive error. I think that's an easy one. You know, we're experts at this. We're experts at figuring out if there's some residual refractive error there. How do we fix that? We talked about it earlier. We can fix it with glasses. We can fix it with contact lenses. If they paid something, then a lot of times we're going to send them back to the surgeon for a refractive fine tune. You know, refractive error can be fixed. Dryness. We've talked extensively about dryness. We have to manage this on the front end. And if we see some on the back end, you got to manage it aggressively as well. We're going to talk a little bit more about PCO here in a second. We'll talk through a case. Positive dysphotopsias, you know, patients that are complaining of glare, halos, those types of things, uh, these can be challenging. And we'll talk about neural adaptation here in a minute, but we have to be patient with these patients uh, when we have dysphotopsias with complaints in their vision, especially if they're seeing 2020, but their main complaint are these feelings of crescents in their vision or glare and halos, those types of things. Problematic near point. Uh, this one is challenging because sometimes patients expected better near vision and they weren't provided it with the different technology that they got. One of my favorite things to do with these problematic near point patients is to go to my lens kit. I dust it off. You know, we all have our lens kits from back in optometry school and grab some minus 250 loose lenses. And if they got a trifocal lens or an extended depth of focus lens, I'll usually hand them something, their phone maybe, and have them hold that at their reading distance. And I'll say, are you able to read that? And a lot of times I'll say, yeah, I can read it, but it's not good. It's not where I want it to be. And then you take those minus 250s and you put those in front of their eyes. And then you say, hey, can you read it now? And they'll say, of course, no, I can't read anything. Take it away and then let them you know, process that and then remind them, hey, you know, yes, you paid for an advanced technology and I know that costs you some money, but with these lenses in, if this is what you would have chosen, a monofocal implant, this is how you would have seen. And so it's just kind of getting them believe in, in the fact that, okay, the lens is doing something. It may not ultimately get to a happy spot, but it's just proving them that the lenses are actually doing something for them and letting them know that they are getting some near point. And then the visually demanding patients, we hope we never put one of these advanced implants in their eye. If I hear a word like, I want perfect vision. Uh, I'm careful. I'm I'm very hesitant to move forward with these advanced implants. So let's talk about a few cases. So cataract surgery with a multifocal implant back in 2019 in the left eye. And about a month later or so, two weeks later in the right eye. They come back to you. They see you. This is the referred, but let's just say you see this patient. And you notice this PCO there and the patient complains of blurry vision, trouble with fluorescent lights, difficulty with nighttime driving due to halos. All those things sound something that could be coming from the PCO and the vision just hasn't seemed right since surgery. Best corrected vision is about 2030 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye. Uncorrected vision, 2050 in the right, 2025 in the left. Okay. You do note the PCO. It's about two plus. The most no I don't know if you're a live audience, I would have someone raise their hand and tell me what is the most important piece that the patient has told you or what's the more, most important piece on this particular slide? But I'll just give you the answer. And that is the vision doesn't seem right since after surgery. That's the most important piece. And that's why you have to ask your patient, was your vision good? right after surgery or not. If the patient told you my vision was great at one week, my vision was great at one day, probably won't say that, but if my vision was great at one week, one month, and then it slowly declined, then my mind goes to dryness, PCO, 
or something wrong with the retina. And we're able to examine that pretty closely. And if the retina is clean and their ocular surface is clean, but they have PCO, I feel very, very comfortable saying, boy, you need a YAG capsulotomy. Let's get that done for you. But this patient makes me nervous. The fact that they said their vision has never seemed right since after surgery, could the two plus PCO be the reason for the 2030, 2025 vision? You bet it could be, but I'm going to be very careful in telling this patient you have a YAG. I'm going to be ultra aggressive on treating the ocular surface. I'm going to get that under control. And I'm going to take a very, very close look at the retina to make sure that all looks normal. Now, if I've treated the dryness aggressively and I have made sure the retina is clear and there's no other reasons for this vision and it has to be the PCO, then I would move forward. But the key here is asking the question of when did the vision not seem right? Was it immediately after or down the road? Because sometimes it does take time. It takes time for these patients to adapt to these types of lenses. It could take three months. It could take six months, but not all patients will adapt. And the last thing you want to do is have the patient get a YAG capsulotomy and then the lens can't be removed. Now it can be after a capsulotomy, but it's a much more challenging surgery. The patient is definitely going to get a monofocal implant. They're not going to be able to keep that particular implant anymore. It's going to have to be sutured in. Uh, it creates a big problem for patients. So that key question is, when have you been happy or when, have you ever been happy with your vision after surgery? Here's a 58-year-old extended depth of focus lens, one month post-op visit. Red eyes dominant. My reading vision is not great. I have to wear readers. Uncorrected visual acuity, 20-20 in the right eye, 20-25 in the left eye. They're reading about J5, J4. You can see on refraction, pretty spot on. And really with an EDOF lens, J5, J4, they should be pretty satisfied. I, I don't expect them to get J1, J2. Lens is well-centered, no capsule or a haze. So what do you do now? What do you tell the patient? And I kind of answered this earlier. I couldn't wait to get to it, so I started answering it. This is where I go grab my trusty minus 250s. Almost immediately, I tell my scribe, hey, will you go grab my loose lenses? I just want to show this patient the difference between what this EDOF lens is doing and what they would be if they had a monofocal. And then I get into a little bit around the EDOF lens again, because remember, these patients probably had a lot thrown at them. I remind them that, hey, this lens, the advantage of it is far away vision, which you pretty much have 20-20 vision, or maybe not quite there, but their main complaint is reading. It's not going to give you great reading, but what if you hold your phone out a little farther? How do you do at the computer? I start talking about the winds. What are the winds around this lens and get away from what the loss is, which is what their complaint is, the reading. Because if I can provide them the winds, typically it puts them in a better spot. And then they need time. It's only been a month. So at one month, I would not panic here. Treat the ocular surface, see them back at their three-month check. They very likely will continue to improve with time. So what is a good time frame to convey for neural adaptation to presbyopia, presbyopic correcting implants. How long should we tell patients that they should plan to adapt? And I kind of gave you this answer earlier already. You know, Justin, while people are weighing in, a question came regarding the light activator, light adjustable lens. Great. What do you do when a patient has an LAL and the post-op refraction is plus a quarter? Do you still treat? Yeah. So great question. Um, so if it's the first treatment you have, so you have to do one treatment, but you can do what's called a power neutral treatment, meaning that if it's a plus a quarter and they're thrilled with their vision, I'm not going to treat that plus a quarter. You're able to program into the instrument, a power neutral, and you just keep them exactly where they're at. And so you'll do that treatment. And then at their next visit, you'll start the lock-ins. Right, we're going to end the poll and share the results. Perfect. I love seeing that 97%. That either tells me one of two things, Joe. It either tells me they were listening or they already knew it, but I'm hopeful it's that everyone was just listening. <laughs> Justin, we, we, I don't think we ever get 100% on anything, just so you know. We're close. Even when I give, even when I give all four answers the same, still can't get 100%.
neural adaptation of multifocal owls. So we talked about this, you know, it could take as long as six, 12 months. I've, I've seen it take that long uh, for a lot of patients. The literature says there's about 10% that really never neuroadapt. That doesn't mean those 10% all need IOL exchanges. You know, that 10% that don't neuroadapt still may function just fine and, and, and live with what they have, but it really is an issue. And, and it's something that we, we need to talk to our patients about. It's going to be less common in my opinion, with the newer technologies than with our older technologies. And of course, it's going to be more common with any lens that has diffractive optics or that's splitting lights and those types of things. And, you know, we've talked extensively about YEG capsulotomies and, and when do that as well. So four major points around the psychology of these implants. Number one, just remind your patients preoperatively, I'm excited you're going to do this lens option, but it's going to take some time for you to be 100% happy. You know, don't expect to be happy on day one. Don't expect to be happy at week one. You may not even be thrilled at month one, but I'm hopeful by three to six months, you're going to be there. It's going to take some time. You've had one visual system for X amount of years of your life. And with one surgery, it's been completely changed. You have a new technology. You're going to see a bit differently. You need to adapt in different ways. And so that's a lot of times the discussion I have with patients is it's going to take some time to adapt to these types of technologies. And then it requires motivation. You know, that guy's pretty motivated right now uh, in that small kayak. He's going to be going fairly quickly. I mentioned earlier that I'm not a salesman. That's not my job. My job is to educate patients, make sure that we're making the right decisions for them. So you want your patients to be motivated to get the technology. My unhappiest patients with these more advanced technology options are ones that weren't overly motivated to have it. And I may have pushed them a little too hard in that direction to get it. And so you want to motivate a patient. You want someone that's really interested in reducing that dependence. Uh, it requires a belief. And that means two things. One, it requires a belief from you, the doctor that's educating. And so you want to understand these technologies. Number one, you want to look at some of the data around them. Number two, because if you don't believe in them, the way that you discuss them, patients are going to figure that out. So you have to believe them. And then number two, your staff, your staff has to believe them as well. So we spend a ton of time educating around these technologies. And it's so important for the staff because if you're like me, I spend two to 10 minutes with a patient. My staff doing a cataract evaluation is spending you know, an hour and a half, sometimes an hour to an hour and a half with the patient. And if my staff member is in there saying, oh boy, you don't want to even think about getting that adjustable technology or boy, I see people all the time that get that trifocal technology that causes so much glare and halo. Uh, when they get in the room with me, that staff member has done me no favors. So the education around it is so important. It requires a belief from not only you, but your staff member as well. And then support. And this is from staff and you as well. And this goes back to earlier. If you have a patient that comes in 20 unhappy and you look at the chart and they're seeing 2020, 2015, and you say to them, you should be happy. That's probably the wrong answer. The answer needs to be, I need to figure out why this patient's unhappy. I need to support them. They're in at one month. They're maybe not quite there. Go back to, hey, it may take time. Educate on the technology again. And so that support is important, again, from your staff as well as yourself. And this was an equation that you know I learned from Vance, uh, one of the surgeons that I work with. When I first started with them, you know, as I knew I was going to be doing a lot of these evaluations, you know, surgeons do a really good job with cataract surgery, right? It's pretty rare that there's a bad cataract surgery. Can it happen? You bet. It can definitely happen at surgery. There's risk with that. That's the results portion of this equation. So a lot of times with results, the results are done pretty dang well. The expectations, that's my job. That's our job. We're seeing these patients. We need to set proper expectations of the different technologies and understand them because if we don't set proper expectations, even if the surgery is done perfect, that's going to affect the satisfaction. They could be unhappy with a perfect surgery because we didn't set proper expectations. Now, vice versa is true. We could set perfect expectations. And if the surgery isn't done beautifully, that can affect satisfaction as well. So I don't want to necessarily, that's always the case, but cataract surgery is done at a, a pretty high rate and a pretty successful rate. We have to make sure we're setting proper expectations to reach that patient satisfaction point. All right. So what I have left is just a few other little post-operative things. And then uh, there's some cases at the end, post-operative case things. And I know we have about 20 minutes uh, or so. So I'm going to kind of stick to that timeline. 
So this is a this slide is is a variable slide, meaning there's centers all over the country, cataract surgeons all over the country doing different ways of, of post-operative drops. So by no means is this an a, a common or, or the most common way that things are being done. But you will hear different terminology for this less drops or drop a day or no drop cataract surgery. There's a variety of different things are being used. And we'll look at the data around in the next few slides, but there's some different preparations being used. This is one preparation, a preparation of dexamethasone, moxiflox, and ketorolac. So you have your steroid, your antibiotic, your NSAID, and then this is injected intracamerally, not into the vitreous. This is injected into the anterior chamber post-surgery or at the time of surgery, really. Uh, you know, in some centers, they're still putting them on drops post-surgery after they do this. Uh, I can tell you how we do it. Uh, so we do this particular mixture. Our surgeon gives them an injection at the, at the end of surgery. And then we still put them on a bottle of a compounded mixed medication that has an antibiotic steroid and, uh, and NSAID in it. And they take one drop once a day for one month. That's how our practice has elected to go. Uh, and it's worked, you know, extremely well. doesn't mean it's the right way. It just has worked really, really well. And we're still protecting our patients based on what we're seeing with some of the safety data around endophthalmitis, which is, of course, the biggest thing that we're trying to avoid with cataract surgery. This was a study looking at patients that in the A group received no antibiotic, in the B group just received an intracameral antibiotic injection, in the C group just received a topical antibiotic, and in the D group received a combination of the two. And you're looking at really the endophthalmitis rates. Now, to be very clear, the good thing that we see in all the groups is the rates of endophthalmitis are low, thankfully. Uh, so you got to look at that and make sure you're looking at this right here. The rates of endophthalmitis are low. We're not looking at 25%. This is 0.25%, 0.2%. The take home is though, that when you combine an intracameral injection along with a topical, there's added protection not only inside the eye, but outside the eye. And there's about a five-fold decrease in endophthalmitis, um, excuse me, five-fold decrease if they just did an intracameral injection alone. It's a larger than five-fold decrease if you combined an antibiotic on top of the intracameral injection. This was the Kaiser study. Uh, so they looked at patients, um, you know, from way back in the past, so 2007, where really only topical agents were being used. Then you started getting into 2008, 2009. In the Kaiser group, they started using some injections. And then in 2010, 2011, they started doing topical plus injections at the same time. In the blue here is your rates of endophthalmitis. Again, very low, keep that in mind, but still higher rates when they were just doing topical drops. As they started incorporating injections, you started to see a decline and the lowest rates being when they had topical plus injection occurring. So poll question number five. What is the most common organism found in acute post-operative endophthalmitis? Are you uh, waiting for everyone for everybody to come in with their answers? A comment was made that dexamethasone may blur the patient's vision a little, or or does it? What what is uh, what is your experience when that's being injected uh, intercamerally, and uh, how long does it last? You and uh, I assume you tell the patients about that. Yeah, I, I do. Um, the nice thing is, it's not the, the the one that we get that's compounded is not cloudy. Um, there are there are forms that are. There are forms that definitely mm -hmm. are, uh, but these forms are are not. So I would err on the side of, and we do that. We use the the form that is not white or cloudy in appearance. Um, the other thing that I get a common question on is is you know IOP spikes with with something that's inside the eye. And we actually did a study on this, and we did it in our glaucoma patients um, because we actually do this same regimen in our glaucoma patients where we put that particular mixture in the eye and they go on one drop a day. So say they're undergoing a MIGS procedure, minimum invasive glaucoma procedure, we do this. But before we did that, we wanted to study it. So we looked at patients that got the traditional drops and patients that got the injection plus one drop. And we found no difference in, in IOP spikes between um, the two. 
And so, um, you know, that, that, um, is something that we, um, we, uh, were, were, um, happy about obviously. And that's what kind of led us down the road to do this. So, all right. So actually the most common answer, uh, is, is epidermidis, the, 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 what lives on the skin. And that's why, uh, with endophthalmitis, you know, there has to be sterile environment. That's why they do a betadine wash. That's why they do all the things that they do to make sure that, you know, the normal natural flora that lives on our body and our skin doesn't create, uh, infections inside the eye. Uh, thankfully again, you saw the rates, uh, very, very low. We're lucky in regards to that, but still something that we have to be aware of and that we have to watch for. Some other things that are kind of out there right now that you may hear about, uh, there's drug delivery devices and procedures being utilized. I don't have any experience with this particular one, but this is injected at the time of cataract surgery. It is some dexamethasone. Uh, and you can see the data on the right anterior chamber cell count at day eight being zero, you know, 60% in the group that received uh, the dexamethasone implant versus the placebo. And then they looked at IOP or safety as well. Uh, this particular little device, or it dissolves. Uh, so it releases the dexamethasone. It dissolves over time and it's a little sticky. And so once it gets in there, they place it right behind the iris. It sticks in its place. So it's not really bouncing around the eye at all. But again, trying to reduce some of the drops that are being used. So if this patient elected to do this, it would be implanted. And then the patient wouldn't be on a steroid. They would need to be on an antibiotic and an NSAID. Another one that's out there, you may have heard of this intercanalicular insert called Dextenza. Uh, you can see the data on the bottom there. It's approved for surgical pain and inflammation. So it's approved for both. This particular device, uh, interesting. I have a little experience with it. Uh, a couple of things around it. Once it gets wet, it expands very quickly. And so what I learned very quickly with it is I'm going to make sure I'm choosing my patient population right. If I'm going to do this, it's done at the slit lamp. Uh, you want to have a puncta that's fairly large um, until you get very, uh, very proficient at it. Uh, you have to dilate before you put it in. And so you dilate very, very aggressively. And right now there's no inserter for it. And so you have to use a forceps to hold it and to put it in. Again, the goal around it is that the patient wouldn't have to take, you know, the steroid because it's going to elute medication for about a month to take the place of that, that, that topical cortical steroid that you would traditionally put them on. So you know, as I, I mentioned, pain and inflammation, Joe, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But we, we had this in our practice for a while and uh, kind of came, kind of came and went, if you go back, uh, go back one slide. Yeah. It doesn't look like that. Uh, just so you know, it looks like a, like a kibasi. And you know when when I get the I got the patients back, half of it was out and rubbing against the conjunctiva. I would take uh, a, the back end of a forcep and like hammer on it, try to get it further further down unsuccessfully. And yeah. universally, the patients who had this said the same thing that the worst part of the entire procedure was getting that put in. Uh, yeah, so I have a little experience with it. My experience has been what yours is, meaning we, Tried to get on board very quickly. It kind of went away. We're trying a little bit again right now. Um, the The challenge really is choosing the right patient and the amount of time it takes. Our surgeon doesn't want to do this in the OR, so it's on the optometrist to place it. Um, and as I mentioned, with no inserter and having to aggressively dilate, and then my tech in there, having it ready because as soon as I'm done dilating, you then have to kind of dry the area and then put it in very quickly. Otherwise you end mm -hmm. up with exactly what you said, uh, a halfway in one, and then you got to remove it. Then you have to remove it. And and so I think it's good to know about it. Mm -hmm. Where it's going to be. I'm not sure if there's ever an inserter, I think that would make its usability so much better uh, because many of us with punctal plugs know how to put those in. We use inserters and it's quick and easy. We dilate with one end of it. We flip it over and we put it in. Uh, I think if we could get something like that, then this would be great. And this also has approval for allergic conjunctivitis. So it really has. I was, about, I was just about to bring that up too. Yeah. I would, I, I myself, it's, it's, it's too much work, you know, <laughs> Justin, in the absence of an inserter, the, the, uh, the, the materials you need are a Velcro strap and bite pads. <laughs> 
hard to argue with you on that. <laughs> There's definitely some work to be done with it. All right. So for the last, I think, 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to just take you through some post-operative cases and, you know, jump in with any questions that you have. So this is a patient one day post-op, uh, vision slightly blurred with some mild discomfort, uncorrected vision, 2040, pinholed to 2025. Uh, you know, I'm not worried about 2040 vision on day one. Uh, that's pretty normal, pretty traditional. You know, these patients are going to have some corneal edema. Uh, you know, they're going to, they're going to have maybe some cell and flare. They're, they're probably going to be seen around that. So that doesn't worry me at all. Uh, 55 pressure. Uh, that's concerning. So a 55 pressure in the left eye, uh, you'll see the photo here in a second of the left eye and then current medications, uh, post-op drops. So before I go to the next slide, I think we would all agree that vision's not concerning. The discomfort's probably coming from the pressure. We got to do something with the pressure. And I think that you have some options. One option, of course, is to throw the kitchen sink at them, you know, grab whatever medications you have from a sample standpoint for lowering pressure and throw it at them. Now, I would not use a prostaglandin. Uh, I would use any other agent but a prostaglandin, not because prostaglandins aren't good, but because they just don't act really quickly. Uh, so a prostaglandin would be more of something you might use long term on someone postoperatively that's having some pressure spikes. But initially... I'm going to throw everything else that's going to be a little quicker acting at them. And then I think if you are in an area that you can prescribe oral agents, this would be a patient where I would consider, you know, some Diamox. And I would probably give them 250 milligrams of Diamox in the office as well, if you're going to go down that particular pathway. Uh, for me, my choice here is typically a burping of the wound. And I'll take you through that. And then I'll take you some considerations after that. Uh, it's quick. It's easy to tap the wound or burp the wound. Uh, you don't have to go inside the eye. I'm going to show you a video of it here in a second. Mm -hmm. And it will get the pressure down to a reasonable spot. And, and we'll touch more on that here in a second of what to expect after you do that. So this is what in, the in, looks like. In, interest, interestingly, Justin, what when, I, when, I, when I, I see, I will see this occasionally. And my, my standard has always been Six six tablets uh, of two fifty diamox. Two they take two in the office, two two after dinner, two tomorrow morning, and I love COSOP PF because they come in these little vials. I can tear off three vials, give it to the patient. That's all they need. Universally, next next day when the patient comes in, when they have a pressure of fifty five, I'm going to see them on a, on the day two follow up. Virtually, they're they're under eighteen at that point. Yeah, you definitely have to see them the next day or the day after, um, you know, even regardless of if you treat it with medical therapy, like Joe, you just stated, which I think is completely 100% reasonable, obviously, um, you know, drops, COSOP, great choice because it's not a prostaglandin, it's going to work very quickly. And then of course, Diamox is going to work, you know, very quickly as well. Uh, don't do the Diamox sequels is the only thing I would recommend. Uh, mm -hmm. mainly because they just take longer to act. So you want to do just traditional, normal Diamox. Um, don't do the sequels because of the length of time. So I, when I burp the wound, I'll traditionally use a, a sterile punctal dilator. Uh, in this particular case, I put some dye in the eye just to identify the wound. Uh, once you do a bunch of these, you won't need to, you won't put fluorescein in the eye. I always give the patient a drop of paracaine. They'll like you a lot more and make it way easier to do it too. Small wound is the one you want to burp. So remember with cataract surgery, there's going to be a larger wound and there's going to be a smaller wound. You want to burp the small wound. And again, this would be only on day one. I'm not going to do this at week one or month one. This is only going to be on day one. And I just put a little pressure on the outside of the wound. I don't go inside the wound, a little pressure on the outside, let a little fluid out. I'll check the pressure after I do that. Make sure that I've got it down to a reasonable spot. And then I typically will add a combo agent if they're not on one. So a COSOP, a Comigan, uh, you know, a Simrinza. I'm naming them all, but I would I would add something as well after I do this. Mm -hmm. I send them home and then I see them back typically the next day or the day after. So a day or two, I usually see them, you know, the next day if they're in town, if they live out of town, I usually see them two days later, but I keep them on that topical agent and I'll check them back. So that if they get a rebound effect, I can manage that. Uh, so quick, easy, fast way to do it. Again, I think you can treat it medic. You can treat it with medicine, or you can do a quick burn whoop. The one thing I will tell you that you need to be careful of with this 
uh, is you don't want to take the pressure too low. Uh, I have seen a decompression retinopathy. So a patient that has, let's say a pressure of 50 and you drop their pressure down to six or five or four, you can actually cause the retina to swell a bit just because that pressure gradient changed so quickly and you can get a decompression retinopathy. So, you know, initially be a little conservative, maybe don't, maybe drop them down to the mid thirties, check their pressure, and then go ahead and do it again until you get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually you'll have such a feel for it that you'll, you'll burp it once you burp it twice and, and you'll move on. Yeah, my, my wife did one of those, uh, re, uh, I shouldn't say recently, you know, she did, she did one new in the practice and the patient went to immediate basal vagal syncope. Yeah. And that can happen too. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So what, what, I, what I've always done, you know, six tablets of Diamox, two in the office, two after dinner, two at breakfast, COSOP PF. I love the little vials. Uh, they go for, they go a long way. And again, I, one day follow up. I've never had anything above. I think. Uh, think. I think above eighteen. And you make a very good point. You know, there are two wounds. There's a small one and a, and a large one. And uh, sort of a clinical pearl is: is a surgeon who did the procedure right-handed or left-handed? Because tells where the wounds are. Yeah, that's that tells you where the wounds. So these would be early emergent post-operative complications, you know, high IOP and end up the minus patient being a lot of pain, super red eye, obviously retinal breaks, detachments. You always want to look to make sure the IOL is there. I know that seems very basic, but uh, when you see your first dislocated IOL on day one, you'll, you'll know it's not basic anymore. Uh, you know, vitreous wounds, iris prolapse, uh, all things that we want to, you know, we'll want to call the surgeon on pretty quickly. And then, you know, we'll talk about a few of these other ones here in a second. All right. So another case, one day post-op, I promise you, this isn't the same patient, different patient. Vision was blurred, mild discomfort. Vision looks pretty good, but look at the pressure on this particular patient. Here's your slit lamp exam. So we have some central kind of decimase folds. I know you don't have, you know, your slit lamp here, but what I will tell you, because I think it matters in this case is that the chamber was still formed. Chamber was mm -hmm. nice and deep. The iris was not touching the cornea or even close to touching the cornea. Yeah, there were a lot of folds in the cornea. Uh, there was definitely some folds in the cornea, but the, but the, it was deep, okay? So there's plenty of room there. And then you did this particular test. So now we have a patient that is Seidel positive. Now, this is a patient that I would tell all of you, you can manage this patient. You don't have to send this back to the surgeon right away. Okay. With this finding, you can manage this patient. We don't need to send this patient back. Now, if the chamber was flat and the iris was touching the cornea, I'm sending that back to my surgeon all day long. But with a deep chamber, some corneal edema, pressure of zero, cyto positive, I'm going to manage this patient. I'm going to try to manage this patient for a little while. So how do we manage this particular patient? First and foremost, put a bandage contact lens on. So I always put a bandage contact lens on these patients. I'm trying to promote healing. I continue the antibiotic drop. There's some controversy around, do you discontinue the cortical steroid or not? The reason that I discontinue the cortical steroid drop is there's some risk with a pressure of zero that the cortical steroid could cause the ciliary body to shut down. And what does the ciliary body or ciliary processes do? They produce aqueous. I want this eye to produce aqueous. I want this eye to produce as much as possible. And so I typically will discontinue the cortical steroid. I have them take an eye shield home at night. I talk to them about eye rubbing because I don't want them to rub the eye. And I have them wear an eye shield when they sleep at night or a pair of goggles that we provide them as well. Uh, I don't wait a week to see this particular patient back, but I will give it a few days as long as the chamber is formed. I'm very comfortable managing this if we do these particular things. Great question. It came up. How many millimeters mercury IOP drop is expected each time you burp the wound? Yeah, it really depends on how long you keep that wound open for, you know, when you tap it, um, mm -hmm. cause you can tap it and hold it and fluid will just keep coming out and you're going to lower mm -hmm. it a lot more. Uh, if you just tap it quickly, 
you know, it, it really depends where the pressure started at. The pressure of 55 with a quick tap, there's going to be a lot of fluid that's going to come out fairly quickly. Uh, mm-hmm. It also depends, is it fluid or viscoelastic? A lot of times on day one, you'll post that and if it comes out very jelly-like, that's just a little viscoelastic that's coming out and that pressure will drop pretty aggressively then as well. Yeah. And Justin, we're getting down to our last couple of minutes. So I just want to give you the uh, the high sign, if you whatever you want to touch on in the last few. Yeah, we pretty much covered most things. These are early, urgent post-operative complications, you know, elevated IOP. Remember, steroid spikes can happen as early as a week, but more traditionally, we see them around two weeks. Uh, hyphema is not common with cataract surgery, uh, but common with MIGS procedures. Most of the time with hyphema, there's not a lot you need to do except education. And traditionally, at about a week, they're going to kind of wash out or go away. Uh, we talked a little bit about a wound leak with a well-formed AC, what to do. I always need to look for retained cortex, anything that, and that's usually in the inferior angle. Again, IOL decentrations, those types of things, that's you're going to refer back as well. These are more post-operative complications. Actually, Justin, in the high fee, how much high fee do you expect to see with a, a MIGS, like a stent? Yeah, I see it almost all the time to a degree. It's just that it's typically a micro hyphema. They're typically not layered hyphemas. And so, you know, that's a very vascularized area where stents are going in. So I, I see it quite often. Uh, it's just education. I tell every patient before we do it that they're going to get it is what I do. Yeah. It, it, interesting. When I, I, was, I was on call, I was not the, uh, the co-managing OD. It was in our practice. And the patient uh, had a, uh, he had a FEMA. He had undergone a, an eye stent and cataract surgery one day post-op. Uh, he had uh, virtually an eight ball high FEMA because either it was pre existing or likely developed as part of the surgery. He developed a cavernous sinus fistula. Yeah, eight ball high FEMA, that's going back to the surgeon immediately. Uh, yeah. When I do my MIG stock, I have a bunch of photos showing that I mm-hmm. you know, don't didn't put those in here right now. So, yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw it by a, te- by a, a text. You know, I, I, I triage the patient, call this, they call the surgeon, they come in, and they said, patient's got a cavernous sinus, uh, cavernous sinus fistula. Good luck, guys. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> not not what you want to see on call or ever, uh, to be yeah. honest. <laughs> yeah, good, good luck, guys. So really in conclusion, and that, that was it, this is right where we need to end, you know, these advanced implants, they do give excellent results and, and they do do good patient satisfaction. I, I really believe they do work the key a lot of times is, is what we talked about around that psychology of things, picking the right patient for the right lens, making sure that these are not offered to put in eyes that, that it shouldn't be put in. Uh, we want to do it. You know, I, I love bullet point two. An ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. It goes to what I just said a second ago that we want to put them in the right eyes. We're going to get post-operative surprises and, and we're the ones that have to manage a lot of these and we're capable of it. Uh, all of you on this call are capable of it. And I hope you feel more capable of it after the last, you know, hour 40 that you've kind of spent with us. Uh, methodically approach to treat residual refractive error. I gave you some tips on that. Could it be a rotated IOL? Could it just be a patient that doesn't understand the technology or they weren't educated properly? And keep in mind that advanced cataract surgery, it, it's a commitment for sure. It's a commitment for the surgery center, but it's a commitment for you as the, the, the referring optometrist as well. But boy, it can make, a lot of patients happy, uh, even if initially they're not happy. So I want to thank everyone for taking time tonight to, to spend it with me. Thanks for the opportunity from the Optometric Education Consultants Group. Uh, please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Joe, you can feel free to pop that in the chat box, uh, my email address. I usually have it on the slide, but for some reason it it's not on there. And I just want to thank you for the evening. What I'll do if you can just stop sharing your screen for me, yeah. then I will take over. All right, hold on. Let me share my screen. We're going to wrap up here. All right, all right. All right. You know, Justin, that was fantastic. Ha- having done this, uh, both the live meetings and, and since we, we got into this with the beginning of lockdown, to be honest with you, uh, I've done as long as well as Greg. Uh, probably we've gone through about 200 webinars that we've hosted. And of course, we don't lecture at all of them ourselves, 
but we've done about 200. I'm going to tell you, this is this is one was probably my top three and may well have been my top one that I've, that I've attended out of the entire 200 that we've hosted. So I was, I, I, I was thrilled the entire time. I thought it was fantastic. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you for saying that.